Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have you here. Uh, my name is Ilan Stavans, and this is the first of six events uh, lined up this semester uh, in the Point Counterpoint series that is connected with the teaching of a course here at Amherst College called Poet Politics and Poetry. Uh, the origins of the series date back to 2016. Uh, just as the presidential election uh, was taking place between uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and the recognition uh, at the end of that year that uh, many of us in the silos, in the enclaves that are called liberal arts uh, institutions were not quite synchronized with what was happening in the rest of the country and that the country clearly was a frighteningly, abysmally uh, divided. Uh, we had ceased to listen to one another. Uh, it is as if two nations had emerged together and that it was time to pay attention to the other side, to humanize the other side. Uh, a series of alums, uh, faculty, administration, and students organize therefore uh, uh, this series. And we have been very lucky to bring to the college a series of personalities on both sides of the ideological divide that go from Brett Stevens to Bill Crystal to George Will to uh, uh, Joe Stiglitz and Amrita Sen, uh, figures that can enlighten us uh, economically, politically, socially, morally on what is going on. And it's an enormous pleasure to welcome today here uh, David Brooks, the columnist for the New York Times and uh, uh, weekly contributor to also to the PBS News Hour on Fridays, where he, together with the, the Gephardt, uh, discusses the two sides of what uh, is happening in the country. Um, this event is sponsored by the seminars on opposing views funds established by the members of the class of 1970 with continuing support from individual alumni and parents. And I invite you to see who is coming in the next three or four occasions. Jericho Brown, the poet who teaches at Emory, uh, the poet laureate of the United States, uh, Joy Arco, the biographer of um, President uh, J.F. Kennedy, uh, Fred Logeval, and the biographer of Robert Frost. The idea is to bring the relationship between politics and poetry really to the fore. And the sociolinguist at Columbia University, John McWhorter. Uh, uh, David Brooks was born in Toronto, Canada, 1961. He went to the University of Chicago. He's been a conservative thinker and commentator for the better part of 30 years, uh, David, maybe I'm, I'm uh, and uh, he is an essential voice in the ideological spectrum of this country. He, aside from the New York Times and the News Hour, he has contributed to the Wall Street Journal and the Weekly Standard and regularly does it for the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, we are going to talk about a number of the topics that David explores regularly in his columns. And uh, I invite people to send questions. We have received already many questions, uh, but we want more through the Q&A. I will be incorporating some of those questions. And also at the very end, we I will be more giving more room to that. Um, David, a real pleasure. I've been a, a, an admirer of your work for many years. You are a, a weekly presence in, my, in our living room here in Amherst, Massachusetts. I'd like to start with uh, inviting you to trace your own journey as a conservative thinker for the last 20 years, maybe since 2003 when you started at the, at the New York Times. But before that, um, you were uh, an intern at the National Review, uh, the important figure of William Buckley there, who, served as a mentor of some of sorts to you. How have you changed uh, in those 20, 30 years? Um, still a moderate, still a centrist? Uh, do you still call yourself a conservative? 
philosophically, first, it's good to be back at Amherst. Um, I've been there many times, so much better than Williams. Uh, <laughs> though when I'm at Williams, I say the reverse, to be honest. We know uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I grew up in Greenwich Village in the 60s to a left-wing household. And the story I always tell is when I was five, my parents took me to Central Park in New York to a B-in where hippies would go just to be. And one of the things they did was they set their uh, garbage can on fire through their wallets into it to demonstrate how little they cared about money and material things. And I broke from the crowd when I was five. I reached into the fire, grabbed a $5 bill that I'd seen, and I ran away. And I, <laughs> I said that was my first step over to the right. Um, and it, it really happened um, while I was a police reporter in Chicago at the very beginning of my career. I'd gone to the University of Chicago. I'd read Edmund Burke, the classic conservative thinker. And he had a concept of epistemological modesty, that epistemology is what we can know and modesty is modesty. Uh, and he said, when you do change, you should do it incrementally, but aware that society is really complex and you'll create all sorts of bad social outcomes unintentionally. And then I was covering housing projects in Chicago that were put in with the best of intentions, but had really turned into terrible places for the residents. Uh, and I thought that's what Burke is talking about. So that remains a lodestone to me that change should be constant, but incremental, and we shouldn't get too hubristic about how much we think we can plan. Burke is a European conservative. I'm an American uh, raised with a very immigrant mentality. And so my other hero is, is Alexander Hamilton, who's a Puerto Rican hip hop star from the Heights. Uh, and now he, um, he, Hamilton stands for something that then became the Whig party and then was an early part of moderate Republicanism, which was if liberals believe in using government to enhance equality and conservatives or libertarians believe in reducing government to enhance freedom, the Hamiltonian tradition believes in limited but energetic government to enhance social mobility. So poor boys and girls can rise and succeed. And Lincoln was very much in this tradition. He gave more speeches about banking than about slavery in his life because he believed in investments and capitalism. So I believe in giving, using government to give people a chance to succeed in a capitalist world. And these are my two lodestones. And they've been pretty much since I was 35 and now we're 20 odd years later uh, and the world has gone crazy around me. <laughs> so what, I, what the Republican party stands for has nothing to do with Edmund Burke anymore mm -hmm. and nothing to do with Alexander Hamilton, as far as I could tell. And populism has taken over it. So I still call myself a philosophical conservative, but the people who call themselves conservatives right now are, don't share many opinions with me. How do you explain, well, let, let's go into the, 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 the present crisis of the Republican party, David, um, with this narcissist at the center who for four years pushed that party to surrender to his own ego. Uh, and uh, even resisting leaving office seems to retain the, the, the hold of that party. I, uh, coming from Mexico, uh, often think in the Latin American landscape of figures like Perón, who even after his death was, was still allowing reverberations in Argentinian politics, and the same thing with Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Uh, Trump did not arrive as a, as a re Republican. He, he was a wishy-washy, constantly changing figure and eventually settled on that Republican side. Um, the Trump effect, uh, the Trump effect after leaving office, where is the Republican Party right now? How do you see it in the next four, eight years uh, connected with the original ideas of the Republican Party, but also with the changing nature of a country that is moving willingly to a more diverse, pluralistic landscape. Yeah, I, I, it, it's weird. And even just this afternoon, I was on a call with about 15 Republicans, all close friends of mine. And in every one of their families, not everyone, but most of their families or in their churches or in their circles, the Trump versus anti-Trump divide is more bitter than it ever was. So something is intensifying right now. And one person said his theory was that a lot of people when Trump was in office, the pro-Trump people felt a little safe. Now they feel even more under assault and they don't want the never Trumpers to start lording it over to them. And so for more under assault, they're building in their fences and they're lashing out even more so, even in members of their own family. It's so intense because it divides families. 
My instinct is that Trump as a personality slowly fades away. I mean, we've barely heard from him since he left the White House. He's off social media. And I was struck at CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Committee, a couple of weeks ago. They were asked to vote who do you want the next nominee to be. And this is the Trumpiest part of the Trumpy party. And only 55% said him. A bunch said Governor DeSantis of Florida. A bunch said a few others. And so there was some impulse that people would like Trumpism without Trump. And I think that's where the party is heading for. It's not going to be the Republican Party we knew. It's going to be like the Tory party in England, which is a working class party for the less educated. Um, but it may not have Trump and some of his toxicity, toxicity may not be there. There may be other toxicity. My, my general explanation for why the Republican Party has gone this way is sort of three, three big narratives. The first, which is you alluded to, we're transitioning to becoming a, a more diverse society. And a lot of people just don't recognize the country anymore. And they feel like they're being shoved out of it or disgraced or political correctness. Second, and this is happening all across Western Europe, certainly, uh, the economy is concentrating in a group of highly educated people, about 20% of the country who mm -hmm. go to schools like this one or where I went to Chicago or where I took, teach at Yale. And those people then move to the cities, concentrate wealth in a few big cities. Uh, half the VC, tech VC money in the world goes to just six cities, New York, Washington, San Diego, San Francisco, and London. Uh, and so those areas get richer. And so the people who live in those cities just take off from the rest of the country. They control tech, they control the media, they control the universities, uh, and they seem to control a lot of politics. And everyone else looks at them and says, we got to stop these people. We need representation. And that's happening throughout Western Europe. There's a Trump everywhere. There's a Bernie Sanders who represents the left youthful revolt, revolt against this movement everywhere. And there's a technocrat like a Macron figure most everywhere. Uh, and so I think that's the second narrative. And then the third one is just the globalization narrative that some people are just being left behind by a global high school economy. I want to stay there for just a minute or two more, uh, uh, David, and then go to the elites, uh, another topic that you regularly write about. It's very different to have a post, say, Perón a party in Argentina once Perón is dead, or a post Hugo Chavez with Maduro once. Uh, but having a post-Trump Republican Party while Trump is around is at the very least a nuisance, if not a, a real complication. The figure is still there, might not have access to Twitter eh, and Facebook and other strategies, but the very presence of him, the imposing presence, the cult of personality um, is, is, is unavoidable. And I wanna connect this with, uh, with another side question. In, in retrospect, I and mean, you've said it in the news hour and in your opinion pieces, um, Many other people have said it too. Uh, we were we were all surprised by the, the his winning of the presidency in 2016. But now that we are six uh, four years later, is there a way to understand where how it could have happened? Is there in, in retrospect a, an explanation of what were the mechanics, the forces in American society that gave place to the emergence? of such a, a polarizing figure. In, in 2015, uh, I wrote like 16 columns, all with the theme, uh, don't worry, Donald Trump will never get the Republican nomination. And so I was living in DC. I was working for a newspaper headquartered in New York. I was teaching at Yale. I was spending my whole life on the Acela. You know, how could I be out of touch? <laughs> and so basically what happened is I stopped teaching and I spent the next few years in two or three states a week. And I went to about 40 states every year, often repeatedly, and just met people and, and interviewed people what journalists are supposed to be doing. And I'll tell you one story of a Trump supporter, a very strong, enthusiastic Trump supporter. I met him in South Dakota. And he said, he was like 70, white male. And he said, my best job was when I was 35. I was working for a foreman of a section of a plant that designed the casements for see a uh, roof refrigerator systems for big office buildings and they re replaced the machinery to make this and I was no longer qualified to be the foreman and so the, they laid me off 
And I wanted to go just quietly. So I went to my office, packed my stuff in a box, opened the door, was just going to sneak out. And I saw all the employees of the plant, uh, I think it was 3,500 people, had made a, a human chain, two lines. And they applauded him all the way from his office door to his car door in the parking lot. And he said, that was the best day of my life. Mm -hmm. Then he described all the subsequent jobs he had in the 35 years since. And they were all worse. And his life had gone down and down and down. Now he was looking after his 90 some odd year old mother-in-law. He couldn't leave. And he said, I need change. I, I got to take a shot. And I think there was a lot of that in 2016. Then when the political war started happening and we in the media started attacking Trump, then it became just a culture war. And Trump became the persona of respect for people like me. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of people who were very ambivalent about Trump in the beginning became hardcore pro Trump. And that's more or less what I think would happen. The only other thing I'll say is that it's always one of the tough things about COVID is we don't get to go out and report. Uh, and so we don't meet strangers as much. And I was at a Trump thing and I met a, if I can remember this correctly, uh, a lesbian woman who had converted to Sufi Islam after surviving a plane crash. And she was a Trump supporter. And I was like, what stereotype does she fit into? And there's a lot of that in American life. A lot of people do not fit the stereotypes you think they do. And so that's never to be underestimated. Um, we'll, go, we'll go there in a second. Um, between the, the actual election early November and the, the, the moment in which Trump finally took off in that plane, uh, I felt that the country was on the verge of a civil war. Um, I'm a recent immigrant, relatively recent, I mean, from the 80s, um, a student of American history, uh, but very much a product of Latin America and the polarizing nature of Latin American politics. Um, did, you, did you feel in the last few months that the country could be out of control, that these two opposing sides could come to, to, to fight each other with the amount of weapons that circulate on the street? Or did you always think that it would come to a, a happy end, if that is what it was? I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it'll come to that kind of conflict. I may be naive. I, I find the people who worry about that the most are friends of mine from Latin America and friends of mine from Eastern Europe. <laughs> they're, they're different political histories there that have been, that make you think go that bad stuff can really happen. I may be naive. Uh, I just don't think, I, we came as close as we've ever come on January 6th, obviously. Right. And, but with the, you know, in, in 1860, you can have a civil war because everyone's just got muskets and rifles. But I don't think the, the QAnon folks are going to have M16s <laughs> or, or F18s. Uh, right. So, you know, I don't think they can really take over. I would say, there's as much bitterness as I've ever seen in my life. There's as much intense social distrust and social fragmentation I've ever seen. Everyone says, and everyone is right, that the a sense that there's truth has come into question, that we have an epistemological regime right. that people believe in. And so this is all terrible. But I would say the, the institutions of government held, and whenever I talk to Trump people, and now speaking to Biden people, there are, apparently there are just lots of untold stories within the institutions, the agencies of the federal government, where professional career people did heroic action to keep their agency alive. And then on January 6th, the officers on Capitol Hill, they also behaved heroically. And so I still have faith, and most people were appalled, even most, a lot of Republicans. So I have still faith there's a kernel of our core country that's still intact. Mm -hmm. and that uh, we may be on the calm down phase, but I am, I've been unrealistically optimistic for the past seven or eight years. So. You said in passing that you might be naive. Um, do you really sometimes, is that a figure of speech or do you sometimes think that you are naive? Yeah, I have a, I just have a, like, I was just, I were a year into COVID and I recall sitting in April in COVID thinking yeah, it'll be over by June. Uh, and so I just may be a foolishly optimistic person. Okay. Um, I, I would say the events of the last five years have really 
dampen that inclination. Yeah, of, well, let me go there. You talk, you write often in one of your books, what well, two of your books deal with American character. You are interested in what is it that it, that defines America in terms of collective character, what are the morals, the ethics. Um, and I want to go there with you. I want to ask you if you think American character is a static, ongoing, self-perpetuating, the way the French character or the, the way the German character, that, that every nation has its own basic elements, basic values that prolong themselves, or if with the four years that we just went through, the essence of the American character could have changed. If the, if the crisis that we have been in are deep enough to change the quality, the, the perspective, the worldview of that American character. Yeah, uh, I think about 50-50. You know, the, the country that Alexis de Tocqueville visited in 1830s is still our America. They, like Tocqueville is still relevant to read because some things are the same. And that, are those things I think include energy. There's sort of a dynamism to the country. When our Puritan, the first European settlers anyway, came here, they had two thoughts. This is a land of abundance and God's plan for humanity could be completed on this continent. And so there was this material moralism. They thought, you know, we can, we can do God's purposes and get really rich in the process. Mm -hmm. And that moral materialism, oh, Chesterton said, the nation with the soul of a church is still here. It's why we fight about abortion. It's why we fight about have spiritual warfare all the time when Europeans don't do that. Um, so I think these some of these traits are, are still in common, that average of behavior is a little different from one country to another. Uh, having said that, what Trumpism represents, and it's not new to America, but it's a kind of conservatism that is not about creed, but about vote, about the people, about roots and about genetics. And that was not the American narrative. That was frankly the Russian narrative. The, the narrative that the good simple people of the country are under attack from outsiders. That's the story Trump told. And maybe that was told in the 1890s by the populists or the Know Nothing Party, but it, it, it was a new implant. And as I said, it's a global implant. And so that shows that even with this, the stability and the, the consistent themes of our country, new things are coming in here and, and uh, disrupting sometimes in good ways, but mostly in bad ways. That, that, the, the, the moral mechanics, the idea that one can come here and through talent ascend and transform one's life, you know, the, the, the controversial American dream, the possibilities of ascending the social ladder through education and through hard work. Um, but you have you often talk also about the challenges of meritocracy, uh, what it is truly about and uh, what is the dream of it. Um, and and uh, particularly about the elites, you were just talking about the elites uh, um, a minute ago. And I'd love to go deeper. I mean, we're here at Amherst College training a almost 2,000 extraordinarily bright, a 18 to 22, the ones that are going to become the next presidents and the next secretaries of state and, and, and doctors. And, and But the question of many of our institutions is, are we are we preparing that elite in the right way? Or are we, the way we have found ourselves often in the last four years, totally non-syncopated with what the country is experiencing. And isn't it, David, the nature of any elite, I'm thinking here of the Communist Party in the USSR, or I'm thinking of in the French Revolution as well, the elites they have at their core self-preservation. They want to remain in power either individually or uh, the, their children and, and successors. So, in a nutshell, all these many columns that you've written about the elite, uh, what are the challenges of the American elite right now in the 21st century? Well, first, we have a big sorting system of which Amherst and Yale and Chicago are part, in which we sort people by their ability to take tests while teenagers. Like, why is the admissions criteria the way it is? I guarantee when you get on the workforce, it's not like that. Second, we have this inherited meritocracy where people who grow up in affluent homes just have a lot invested in them. The average college educated parents 
spends $5,000 per kid per year just on extracurriculars. That is not affordable for most Americans. And as a result, the only people who can really get in, even when there's generous financial aid packages to a lot of elite schools are people who grew up in upper middle class suburban homes with nice high schools or private schools. And so the of the top uh, 32 schools, a study a few years ago, there were more kids from families in the top 1% than the bottom 60%. And this is true when I taught at Yale, I would ask my students to describe where they're from. And it was from the east side of Manhattan, the west side of Manhattan, Greenwich, Marion, Pennsylvania, Bay Area, you know, it's the same. And so we have unfairly, um, uh, an elite is okay as long as it's porous. If it becomes self-replicating, which ours has, then it's a problem. And I think we are all coming to recognize this and slowly doing stuff about it. But Michael Sandel, has a, the Harvard professor, has a, a book out called The Tyranny of Merit. And he says this problem of people, people in good schools coming from the top 20% has not, we've not made much progress in that over the last 20 years. And if that's true, that's disturbing because a lot of people are trying really hard. Uh, but so that is a problem. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, and as somebody once said, when we, people like me critique the meritocracy, we do it with sledgehammers. When we propose reforms, we do it with screwdrivers. <laughs> we don't really want to change the fundamental thing. I mean, the, the places I teach, the schools I go to are beautiful places, but maybe there have to, and the one place that I does see that does this with a sledgehammer and fixes it is frankly, Arizona State University. And there's a guy named Michael Crow, and I've spent time visiting and he says, every other university wants to make itself more exclusive. I want to make myself more inclusive. So the Honors College at Arizona State University has more people in it than Stanford University entirely. As he says, we have more Jews than Brandeis and more Muslims than Jews. <laughs> so they, it's, they're just operating on a massive scale. And as far as I can see, quite a good university. And how would you, and you said you, you, you can critique it and you see what uh, professors are doing, what, what would you do in order for, those, for the, this self-perpetuating self elite to open up? Because it is, in the, it is in its nature to continue to enclose. It is easy to read the New York Times in the morning with a nice coffee. Uh, David Brooks is criticizing us. You close the, the, the Times and then you continue with your life as is. Um, it's not as if David Brooks is very subversive by stating this. It's not offering a particular a solution is there is is there a way out of this, uh, David? That you could that you could invite people to, to 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 reflect on. Well, as somebody who graduated in the bottom half of my high school class, I think grades don't matter that much. So, um, you know, <laughs> it, you don't, it, maybe you don't have to have a three point nine GPA to get into places like this. Maybe you're looking for life experiences. Maybe you're looking for somebody who took a year off to while their grandmother was dying. Uh, maybe you're really. I mean, in the real world, this sort of stuff really matters. It's like when I hire somebody, not that I do a lot, but I do some hiring, I'm looking for somebody who took a choice that took them outside the status system. Uh, and, and that they, they made a non-obvious choice. It was not what the country wanted them to do, but it was something they wanted to do on their own. A friend of mine who does a lot of hiring says at the interview, he says, uh, tell me about a time you lied and were ashamed of it. Uh, and so people want to know if in a workplace, they want to know if they can count on you when the chips are down. And they want to know another person who hires, hires for a spirit of generosity. And in his company, there's a vibe of generosity. And so the criteria we use, I think, are too small. And it's because we're, we're all rated and ranked by U.S. News and other places based on this criteria. And, and it and I would say of the kids, the students I had at Yale who are most uncomfortable, it's probably rural white conservatives. Uh, but a lot of kids from inner cities are also kind of uncomfortable. The one thing I noticed is a lot of the kids from the uncomfortable places, they all talk, say, you know, there were my friends in high school who should also be here. The kids from the upper middle class places never say that. And it's like, yeah, I'm here. Um, isn't, isn't there a, 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 an advantage? A and even a, a beautiful asset, David, in the fact that it is that discomfort that will provoke. I mean, I'm thinking of various students of mine 
And uh, I like that discomfort. I like the, 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 th the one that will tell me I'm not fully satisfied with the education that I'm getting. I, I feel this is a, a club match. This is too alien to me, but I need to be here. I need to decode what is happening around. Um, that kind of, many of us who entered universities and were shocked by, by, by what we saw there, it was that shock that became such a, an epiphany of where we could be. Yeah, I, I did a class at Yale um, and it was based on the idea that college students over the next 10 or 15 years of their lives, most of them will be four big commitments to a vocation, many of them to a spouse and family, to a community and to a philosophy of faith. So it was, it was about how to make the big decisions of their lives. But it, my students called it therapy with Brooks because we just spilled our guts out to each other. And at the end of the term, one of the students who was a fantastic student who's going to go into our Rhodes Scholarship said, this class has made me a lot sadder. And that was a total win for me because he was doing all right by the normal standards. If I could make him sadder because he was thinking about these other aspects of life, mm -hmm. then I felt I was doing a good job. And one of the things I found among my students, incredible hunger to ask the big questions. An incredible sense of, I'm here now, I'm learning, but I want to be a moral person. I want to have a sense of purpose. How do I go about doing that? And I, well, now I'm not teaching. I miss being around people who are who are asking the big questions. And yeah. that was certainly true of the college students I knew. David, we were talking about in critiquing the right in the Republican Party, but I want to invite you because this cannot be an echo chamber type conversation to do the same with the left. Uh, the 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 Trump uh, Antifa, he, the argument that he had about Antifa. I want to I want to talk about the cancel culture. I want to talk about woke culture. I want to talk about where you see a liberalism in the, the, the Democratic Party too, and particularly young people today. Um, what it, Young people on the left, what is it that you see there that gives you hope? But what is the critique too that is coming? Why, why, why are we so, when, just to give you a sense, Amherst is in no way unique when in this series, a point counterpoint, there were there was an invitation for George Will to come. I got uh, a phone call from the central police saying that it, because of his position on on abortion, it would be best if we had a policeman or two uh, attending the, the the conversation that we were going to have. And at first, I felt uh, uncomfortable. Um, uh, and maybe the best anecdote to me of all this, the many occasions is that, the, that nothing happened. And uh, as I was walking out with George Will, the policeman said, oh, Professor Stevens, I really thank you for having invited me to this. I learned a lot in that conversation. Um, but there was an attempt in certain groups of maybe we shouldn't be giving a voice to those that don't speak like us, that don't say exactly the same things. Um, Pretty distressing. Please take it from there. Well, the, the upside is a lot, there's a lot more moral passion on campus now than there was five or 10 years ago, I would say. My students were much more into getting a job <laughs> and now it's social justice. So that's, that's the upside. The downside, and this is a long problem, over the last 40 or 50 years, the American universities, especially the East Coast ones uh, and West Coast ones, and the American media have basically expunged 40% of the country and say, you're not worthy. And if you tell people their voices aren't heard, aren't worth hearing, they're gonna react badly and they have. And so the fact that the faculties are so disproportionately to the left, is just uh, a disgrace, frankly. And that's true of my newspaper, it's true where I teach. And I went to teach. And when I first taught at Yale, I didn't talk about my political views. I didn't talk about political philosophy. Now I do just so they can meet one in the course of four years. Uh, and so that's one thing. Second, when I would take the train up from Washington to New Haven, I was going from a place with more free speech in Washington to a place of less free speech in New Haven. And it should be the reverse. Politics should be more bloodthirsty than a university, a great university. And so the narrowing of speech has really been stifling. And I once had a student from Texas, and this is five or six years ago, say, I've never seen so much fear. And a bunch of the undergrads, he was a law student, a bunch of the undergrads came up to me, asked for and said, yeah, I agree with him. 
And that was five or six years ago. It's gotten way worse now. And I would say I'm proud of my, my alma mater, University of Chicago, because it, it, they have maintained a strong position. We are not safe space. You're here to hear ideas. And ideas are like a gem tumbler. And um, the uh, speech is not violence. And people are not to be essentialized by according to one identity. And I'm, I'm always surprised that so many people not only want to reduce other people to an identity, they want to reduce themselves to an identity. And that seems to me to, to insult the dignity of the human person. And then the final riff <laughs> on this little tirade is, is mercy, uh, that no one is outside redemption. No matter what they did or what they said or what they tweeted, there is a possibility of redemption for all human beings. And to treat that person with mercy is, it, is to give them a chance to um, be part of your community. Martin Luther King said, forgiveness is not about denying the wrong. It's saying the wrong is not going to be a barrier to relationship. Mm -hmm. You can't forgive and say, no, I'm not going to be in relationship with you. That's not forgiveness. And so I, I do think we've, there's been a deterioration in the quality of mercy. At the same time, there's been a deterioration in the size of what's sayable. And those two and, things are bad. And is, the, and is this deterioration and the quality of mercy also a reflection, David, of the fact that uh, pick up people through social media uh, and other forms of instant communication can say things very quickly and, and they can be amplified rapidly uh, and you are what you say and you become concentric groups that uh, you become my friend if you like what I said and you become my enemy if you are if you're not in that center um, uh, you know social media is an extraordinary uh, technology, but it's an, it also an extraordinarily noxious and destructive technology because everybody can say almost anything on social media. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to tell you just something. I am very interested in, in, in selfies, in what, what they mean, how they, the connection between selfies and self-portraits, Rembrandt, in, in the Picasso, in Andy Warhol, and in, in, in others. In the, I, I once asked my students if their uh, generation is more narcissistic uh, than the previous generation because of the amount of selfies. Uh, this is proof. And very shrewdly, one of them said, it's not that we are more narcissistic, it's that we have more ways to express that narcissism that your generation had. So that, that the absence of that mercy it worries me the way it worries, worries you, uh, but, but worry doesn't fix things. Uh, I wonder if you think that we reach there because the, the, the outlets that we have are, are such that are not allowing us to hear others and that are amplifying the hatred rather than amplifying the, the compassion and the empathy. Yeah, well, the, we actually have tests on narcissism. There's a thing called the narcissism test, which social scientists use. And what they do is they read a bunch of statements um, to people and they say, does this apply to you? And their statements like, I like to look at myself in the mirror or I find it easy to manipulate people because I'm so remarkable or somebody should write a biography about me. And the, the data is a little old, so it's probably like six, seven years old. But in the previous 20 years, the median narcissism score had gone up 30%. So there's a sense and, and with that, a desire for fame. Uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, you did not want to be famous. It was not something people aspired to. The number two, one and two things that college students aspired to was A, a meaningful philosophy of life, and then I think B, financial security. Now it's financial security and fame. Uh, and so you, th there has been a bit of a culture shift on these fronts. Um, as for the um, mercy, I, you know, I'm, my next book, I, as I was going around the country, I was... Um, hearing again and again, no one sees me, no one hears me. And this was not just middle America, this was African Americans who felt that whites didn't understand their daily experience. These Republicans and Democrats looking at each other with incomprehension. This was people stuck in marriages, realizing the person who should know them best has no clue. So I came to think that the art of being able to see someone and make them feel seen and heard and understood is like a very crucial skill at the center of every classroom and, you, and company and nation. 
And so I wanted to know what is this skill? And so I'm, that's my, my book and I'm trying, that's my way to contribute to this problem. And I was actually, we have to talk about Harry and Megan, obviously. Uh, and <laughs> I, I was really struck brought it up. their interview, but I was also struck by Oprah. Mm -hmm. And she, if you want to see a symphony in empathy, just look at her facial reactions, look at how she's, uh -huh, and look at how she's feeling, everything she's seeing. Uh, and I, uh, not to name drop, I've been interviewed by Oprah twice. And it's very, she makes you feel completely at home, even though she's a global superstar, but she really, she shines a light on you that's so bright, it illuminates and you wanna be your, your best self. I wanna, I wanna use the, the opportunity of uh, you mentioning your new book uh, on, on, you know, hearing and, 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 and empathizing with the other to ask you something that a student of mine asked me yesterday when we were reading many of your pieces. Um, and that is um, the, the rhythm that a columnist like you needs to have once a week now, but before maybe sometimes twice a week or once a week for the Times and once a week for the, for the Atlantic, uh, you have to uh, send copy pretty fast, come up with the idea, uh, you have to articulate thought, and then you see yourself right there on the page. This is what I think. This is what other people are going to think that I think. Uh, and I, I, I want to, I want you, you to bring us to the to the rhythm of David Brooks keeping his thought on the run, so to speak. Yeah. Well, I tell college students: imagine you have a paper due in three days. And then imagine that's the rest of your life. Like that's what it is. And, and so I used to, before I took this job, and when I was doing twice a week, especially, I would um, have all sorts of normal human drives for food, water, sex. Now I just have a drive for column ideas. That's all. I <laughs> and so I used to fantasize. Oh, I could win a lottery, but it wasn't the money. I just said, oh, I could get a column out of that. Yeah. If I got hit by a bus and survived, I could get a column out of that. And so you, you're always just desperately thinking. I'm not that opinionated. A person. The one thing I do is uh, I, I have a view that the more creative the, the art, the craft, the more routinized the activity has to be. Right. So I, I wake up at seven or so and I'm in the right here in my little office here, 730, and I'm writing till 12. It's, I don't talk to people until I've written a thousand words. I do that every day. I've probably skipped 200 days in the last 30 years. Does that mean that you go to sleep thinking what's going to happen at 7.30? Uh, if you, if I cast the camera over there, you'd see a group of piles of paper on my mm -hmm. desk, which are the notes I have for what I'm going to write tomorrow morning. And mm -hmm. just one thing, just because if we have students, I like talking about how I write, just to give them an idea how it can be done. Um, so I have bad short-term memory, so I write everything down, and then I Xerox off pages from books that I need. And I, I lay them out on the floor in a bunch of piles. And each pile is a paragraph in whatever I'm going to write. So to me, the process of writing is not typing on the keyboard. It's laying, crawling around the floor, laying out my piles. And then, um, then I put, pick up a pile, write the paragraph, throw the paper in the garbage, pick up the next pile. So I tell my students, by the time you, you get to the keyboard, your paper should be 80% done. Because mm -hmm. writing is about traffic management. It's about structure. It's not about prose. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that's how I do it. And, and the, do you sometimes, after seeing, after all these years, David, uh, and the difference between writing a book, because writing a book, you, you process, you, you let things sit, in uh, uh, writing all these columns, do you sometimes see the column that appeared the week before and think, well, I could have made that argument better, or I'm not so sure that I'm, I'm thinking here of Walt Whitman's, you know, I, I, I contradict myself. Okay, I contradict myself. I am made of multitudes. Um, do you see sometimes regretfully what you published a week ago or two, or even going back, what you published uh, in, in, you know, their crucial opinion pieces or moments in your career that people get very angry about the, the, the Iraq invasion, for instance, and what you thought. Um, do you, I would like to hear you reflect on how can someone who writes so frequently and communicates with his audience so consistently can be really consistent? Yeah. Well, um, 
I, I don't write to tell people what to think. I would write to provoke them to think. And so that means you're often a little more sure in print than you are in real life. Mm. It also means, and because it's happened so fast, I would say there's never been a column that I'm completely satisfied. Mm -hmm. Go back, I think I should have done that different. I should have done that. With a book, it's a little different because you have time to reflect. And so when I look back on my career at the big regrets, there's a little regrets. Every column is a failure on some level. And so you yeah, just live with that. The big ones, obviously, you mentioned the biggest mistake in my career intellectually, which was during the Iraq War. And that came about because I had been covered, I had been in the Soviet Union watching that collapse. I'd been in South Africa when apartheid collapsed. I thought democracy was really on a roll and the Middle East should be next. And I underestimated the a lot of things, but so I got that wrong. Just today I'm writing about the COVID relief bill. And I when Barack Obama came into presidency in 2009, he wanted this big stimulus package. And I still had a lot of fiscal conservatism in my head. And I urged him to not do a 900 billion package, but do a 400 billion package. That was also wrong. And mm -hmm. so you've learned that the American get away with more deficit spending. And then your, your, your view of um, the, what is the salient problem in the country shifts. So in the early, when I was a young conservative, I was supporting Ronald Reagan. I thought and still think that Reaganism was the right approach to 1970s stagflation. Mm -hmm. High inflation, high unemployment, we needed the economic shock that Reagan wrote. That's not our problem now. Our problem is inequality. And so I support the COVID relief bill because I think it really strikes a body blow at child poverty and inequality. And have I changed my mind? Well, circumstances have changed. And I've tried to see the circumstance. Somebody who's for tax cuts all through their life is a weird ideologue because sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not appropriate. Uh, and so I, I've tried to change along with that, but it looks like I've moved left just because the problems are more <laughs> solvable by left-wing means than they used to be. And I see, you know, there are so many comments reacting to so many things that you have said, but uh, in, I have two or three that I rescue here, David. One of them is if you could, if, you, if the young David Brooks could see more conservative maybe that, than in not knowing how the country shifts and David Brooks shifts too. If the, if the young David Brooks could meet the almost 60 year old uh, David Brooks, um, would they be able to talk to one another? I think there's a Borges story where right. a guy sitting on a bench and he meets his younger self yeah. and they can't talk to each other because- They can't, together. right, right. <laughs> Is that the case with the two David Brooks? Um, I was certainly much more ideological then. And I was certainly much more emotionally blocked then. <laughs> um, so, would you have pity on your on your on your earlier version, or no? You I, I, I would tell myself, get out of your head a little more, uh -huh. uh, and and I, I would say, I, you know, I would talk more about. I think I had I went through until I went through a hard time. I had emotions, I think, but there was no immediate avenue between my emotions and my mouth, so they didn't come out. And partly, it's just how I was raised. Um, but now I, I'm, I wrote a book about emotion. I, I, typical inhibited guy, in order to experience emotion, he writes a book about emotion. <laughs> but I would say I'm more, um, I'm certainly, I think, more emotionally open. I would talk about that stuff with my younger self more than, you know, Edmund Burke or Hayek. But you would tell him, get out of your 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 kind of the square mindedness, but he would tell you that you're, you sold out. He might. Yeah. Cause then when you were a conservative at national review or at the Washington times or the wall street, you were part of a, um, a real counterculture. Like you're in mm -hmm. New York city and you're conservative and people are call, calling you Hitler all the time. And so there was a strong sense of solidarity and a sense of movement. And I would say of my friends from that era, half are still very much my friends. And the other half I look at and think those people are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> They've gone way off over here. And, but, but a number of, most of them I would say are still my friends. David, can you read, do you read the, the comments that people write to your columns? Do you get uh, annoyed by the cri criticism that, I mean, you generate as you obviously know, a lot of ink uh, just in this, 45 minutes, it's hard for me to keep up with everything that is being written. And when I see certain pieces of you in the Times, I mean, just reading all the comments would take half a day. Um, do, you, do you pay attention? Is it, is it 
are, are you only in your office or in the Acela and or in visiting this? And how much do your readers in the Times or the viewers of the News Hour really matter? Or frankly, it's very hard to be listening to. You have to have your own integrity and your own your own sense of self. Yeah, it was hard at first. And so my first six months at the Times were the most depressing professional period of my life because I'd never been hated on a mass scale. And I was reading all the comments and I got so depressed because it was just a personal barrage. And people, there's a saying that sociopaths are emotionally intelligent. They know what it takes to hurt you. <laughs> and they, a lot of people right. critique, would critique things that, that really hurt me. And so I made my assistant read them <laughs> and then he got depressed. And then I went for a period where I didn't read them. Now my skin is thicker and now I will sometimes read it, depending on the column. Because some columns I really want to know what people think and it's probably not a column that's going to generate outrage. Mm. Uh, but I would say the, the thing I notice most is often the angriest responses are not in response to something I wrote in the column. They're in response to the label which I wear, which is conservative. Mm. And so it's assumed I'm I believe certain things because this label is here. And you, you really see the power of labels. Mm. And that label, that label become, becomes a prison for you? Because you're labeled like that, your pieces are read, are read in a particular way. Were you not labeled like that, you would be freer maybe, but you could not you could not, not be labeled. Yeah, I mean, I, I went through a period where I stopped calling myself conservative and I called myself a moderate because in the political frame, I'm certainly a moderate. I, I think now I wrote one column saying I'm on the right, I saw an Irving, Ber Isaiah Berlin, sorry, not Irving Berlin. And <laughs> okay, very different. Isaiah Berlin statement where he said, I'm very happy being on the rightmost edge of the leftmost tendency. <laughs> and I think that's about where I am. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a big, I'm a big, Bi I like Biden. Um, yeah. I'm more of the Biden of the campaign than maybe the Biden of the presidency. But, um, but that still puts me to the right of where most New York Times writers and, and readers are. And that's most of the criticism. I assume that the criticism that comes from Times readers or News Hour readers, both lefty, is very different from the conservative groups. Where you probably what what's the how do, how are you seen today in, in the conservative fields? I'm sorry, my ignorance. I'm mostly on the other side. Yeah, I mean, I, I was a big target for a while for Rush, um, and I was sort of the the wimpy New York Times liberal. My friend Charles Cradhammer, the late Charles Cradhammer, was once asked. Who's your favorite liberal columnist? And he said, David Brooks. And, uh, <laughs> um, I would say um, I, the people who write to me are, are I, I'm more readers because of them at the times on the left than on the right. But people who come up to me angry on the street and scream profanities at me tend to be the Trump people. Hmm. And so uh, I've managed to have no fans. <laughs> yeah. two sides. We're coming to almost to the end, David. And I want to ask you now, to talk a bit about your religious journey. Um, religion in American life, but religion in, in David Brooks's life. I understand, please correct me, uh, you come from a, a, a Jewish family, a Jewish background, um, though not uh, Orthodox or re attending synagogue. Um, uh, and you have been very interested in morality, in ethics, in values, uh, the connection between th those realms in religion and where you find yourself more recently. Uh, I also wanna ask you along the way, if uh, you, are, you know, one often hears in liberal circles that uh, religion is going down in America, that the religious fervor is, uh, is on the, is winding down. But one goes on the other side and one hears the opposite, that uh, religion is on the way up. So um, you and America, how they have changed in terms of religion. Yeah, so I grew up in a Jewish home, as you said, with a Jewish immigrant past. And, but I went to a, a church school called Grace Church School in Lower Manhattan. And for 23 years, I went to um, a church camp called Ch Incarnation Camp, which is in Connecticut. Uh, and so through my childhood, I had both stories in my head, the Exodus story, the Jewish story, and then the Jesus story. And I sang in the choir at the school and because it was New York, we were about 30% Jewish and we called it the All Jewish Boys Davening Choir. And we would sing the hymns, but we'd leave out the word Jesus to swear with our religion so the volume would drop down in the church. And so I had both those stories in my head and I saw the different kinds of goodness. The Jewish kind of goodness is chesed, it's loving kindness. 
It's what you get at a home, a Jewish home. The Christian kind of goodness is, is agape, it's selfless love. And I saw both those kinds. And my general line is that every church service is more spiritual than every synagogue service, but every Friday night Shabbat meal is more spiritual than every church service. And so I was living with these things, but it didn't matter because I didn't believe in God anyway. So they were just two cultural traditions that I drew wisdom from. And then about 10 years ago or so, and I would have moments of where ethereal enchantment seemed to creep through, some sense of grace, of God's love. And as Paul Tillich said, the ground of being. And so gradually, 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 and uh, reading sp spiritual books and being around beautiful people and seeing a kind of goodness, I began to feel grace before I experienced God, just presence. And there was never a moment where like, Jesus walked in the door and said, come follow me, <laughs> like that never happened. But I liken it to riding on a train and you're sitting on the train and you're surrounded by people and you're drinking your coffee and you're looking at the newspaper and nothing seems to be changing. But then you look outside the window and you realize you've traveled a long way and there's a lot of ground behind you. And at some point you crossed a boundary. And I began to feel that. And then when I began to explore this with both my Jewish and Christian friends, everybody started sending me books <laughs> like, and like 500 books of, of one team or another, only 350 of which were mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Like everyone sends me that. <laughs> and so I began really exploring it and I felt both stories deepening. So I felt more Jewish than ever before because it wasn't just a book, it was a living covenant. But I couldn't say no to the beauty that I find in the Beatitudes. As one writer puts, that's where the celestial grandeur peeks through. I just find it astonishingly beautiful. And so my Jewish friend said, yeah, sorry, we don't allow both. <laughs> yeah, it's just not how it is. And so uh, I guess I joined American Christianity at the moment it was disgracing itself in zillions of ways. Um, and um, don't, I don't quite, I know how, the good news is if you can change in this fundamental way in your 50s, hopefully you can change in your 60s. It's never too old to have a fundamental life change. And yeah. who knows? I mean, it's exciting when, you, when you, you're never too old to change. But it was because your friends told you that you couldn't have both. That well, you I mean, if you believe that Jesus is this divine figure who says these holy words, that's not part of Judaism. I don't know. That's not. That's there's no reform. You can't reform. <laughs> okay. Now, I, it, it's, it's how do you see the the awakening or the opposite in America of the role religion plays? Yeah. in the post-Trumpian years? There are some religions that are thriving. Chabad, the ultra-Orthodox, not the ultra, but the Orthodox sect of Judaism is exploding. If you drive through Brooklyn on a Saturday morning, Orthodox Jews are everywhere. Most everyone else is suffering. And the number of synagogues, I read this in Tablet Magazine recently, the number of synagogues in America has declined by a third since 2000. Um, the number of people who don't go to church is just exploding. And it tends to be people who are young and look at the church and see A, a racist past, B, a misogynistic present. And they said, no, it's not for me. I'm be spiritual, but I'll find it some other way. And so I see a lot of people leaving the church. And a lot of my friends who are quite religious find themselves ashamed by a lot of the alliances with Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't know where, they don't have a home. There's a woman that just this week, it was in the Southern Baptist Convention named Beth Moore, a very gigantic figure in the Baptist world who left that convention in part because of Trump, in part because she's a woman and sexism. And I find I'm surrounded by a lot of people who have these feelings. And I feel that there's going to be spiritualism or religious affiliation ebbs and flows in American history. In 1913, it was super low, 1955, super high. And we're now at a low, but if, Past is prologue, young people today will find some way for their spiritual longings to be met, especially mm -hmm. when they're having kids. And I imagine they will create something that I hope and expect will be better than what the options we have now, because I think there are some beautiful churches and beautiful synagogues and beautiful religious leaders and mm -hmm. moms and so on. But 
uh, that average is not what you would expect it to be. And I always tell my religious friends, for all the ways we people of faith talk about goodness, you'd think our behavior would be better. <laughs> like, we're not any better than secular people. <laughs> so it's, that's surprising. <laughs> Yeah. So I have two questions, one of them uh, to, com to conclude, David, and I, 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 it's been delightful to be in conversation with you. One of them is connected, uh, that comes in the thread, and it's connected with conspiracies today, and particularly the, the nervous, ethereal presence of, of, of media, not trusting media, you being right there at the heart of the, one of the most important uh, you know, legacy medias. Um, the, as we move away from the Trump years where fake news was a key term that kept on being repeated uh, time and time again, um, the, this fracture that you were talking about, uh, that we no longer have a common truth, that this, the, the texture of the, in the, the, the glue of America is, is disintegrating. Um, is there a reversal that you can see uh, in the building of trust related to truth that as it comes from people like you or others that are mostly reaching the rest of us through a screen or through a printed page or through the radio? Yeah, well, I think one of the reasons they don't trust us is they don't see versions of them with us. So that, you know, I, as I said, I spent these four years and I spent most of my career really interviewing. That's what I do. I, you would call it going to a bar, but I would call it journalism. Uh, and, and they just, a lot of people, when I say I'm from the New York Times, they assume everything I say is going to be false. That's it. They, they've written off the whole, not just the Times, but the whole mainstream media. And Rush and other people have encouraged that. But mostly I think it's, it's a loss of trust and they don't trust institutions. And you know, it, you, a generation ago, 80% of Americans trusted institutions. Now it's like 19%. And they don't trust each other. What they call interpersonal trust has dropped from about 50 or 60%. Yes, my neighbors are trustworthy to about 33%. And for young adults, it's about 18%. In, the Den in Denmark, 75 or 80% of people say, yeah, the people around me are trustworthy. In America, it's 32. Mm -hmm. When you don't feel you can trust the people around you, then life feels very precarious. And I've been in situations where I couldn't feel I trust people. It, it's really eerie because you don't know when the blow is going to hit. You just know you're unsafe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your view of reality is reflected by how safe you feel. Yeah. And when you feel under threat, then conspiracy theories serve a lot of goods. Like psychologists say, when you have an emotion, you have to ask yourself, what's the function of this emotion? Mm -hmm. And the function of a conspiracy theory is A, to give you a sense of power and agency, I'm the one who understands what's really going on. B, to define the evil against the good. You're on the good side, they're on the evil side. Yeah. And so conspiracy theories, and plus everything's got explained. People don't like uncertainty. Right. And so conspiracy theories serve a lot of psychological problems, but you can't address them directly. You have to make people feel trusted and safe, which is why I celebrate the people who are building relationship and community at the local level, because it, Trust isn't built on a mass scale. It's built by relationship and community and neighborhood and thick institutions that form people. David, last question. It might be kind of a trick. A, a, you had a friend who asks in an interview, have you lied and what that made you feel? So let me throw it back to you. Have oh, you yeah. lied and, and how did, is there a moment where you lied and, and how did that make you feel? Yeah, I'm... I'm we all think of the bad moments in my life. I'm not going to tell you what it is, if it's okay. <laughs> but I, I think uh, I was shocked that I was doing it. It's like you don't, you didn't think you were capable of this, but you got yourself into a situation and you just, you, A, you think there's no way out. I'm trapped forever here. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, but then you, you're shocked at what you're capable of if thrust in a, a wrong situation. And um, you feel ashamed and you feel, um, yeah, I've never been asked this question before. Uh, but yeah, I, I, and how do you get back on track? How, how, do, you, how, do, how do you live with that, uh, that sense of, is it still me? Um, how do I correct this? Uh, yeah, in my case, I got caught and I was forgiven. 
And the uh, forgiver, when you get forgiven, when you un don't deserve it, when, I mean, you do all the, the rituals of forgiveness, of penance, confession, renounce the sin and try to make amends. Um, but you, um, it, it's, a, it's such an act of, of redemption. And you, you sure feel, it, you, you really feel um, someone has done you something you did not deserve. Mm. And um, that, that's a powerful way to admire another person. I guess that's a, that's a powerful way to end this also, the, the capacity to see the one on the other end who you don't think has ideas like you or who could have done something that you didn't like and say, well, I could, I could forgive. Could we talk? Could we listen? I appreciate enormously you coming, uh, David. It's been uh, enlightening. It's been humanizing um, uh, the, the possibility of getting into your head and seeing how the whole process works. Uh, and I want to invite everybody to tune in next week with uh, Jericho Brown, who writes a beautiful poetry. He won the, the Pulitzer Prize uh, for his book, The Tradition. Uh, David, thank you very much. Right, it's been a pleasure. Anybody who combines politics and poetry is right by me. And I'm a big fan of Jericho Brown, so definitely tune in. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.